Mr. President, we need to start with events. <coughs> we need to start with events in. Uh, in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, around the world, where the, the riots have been prompted in many ways by poor living conditions and a lack of food or, or rising food prices with political overtones that now are, are starting to get out of control. Well, I think you've got different issues there. I think in those countries there's been some issues brewing for a long time in terms of the politics of legitimacy, accountability. You're right. Food prices can often set things off because when prices go up, it's a strain on all of us. But for those living at the lower end, it's a very big part of their budgets. And so I think one of the issues we're going to see uh, in general is higher food prices because we're now getting more people from the developing world upgrading their diet. But then if you have particular conditions, weather conditions, issues with stocks, export bans, it exacerbates it. So are you concerned that those higher food prices may be running ahead of society's ability to cope and therefore creating instability? Um, I think there's an opportunity, uh, which is also just rising food prices, meaning that we can create some opportunities for poor farmers in the developing world if we get them into the value chain, in the, get them into the market. But no doubt, in the short term, you also have these dangers of volatile prices, and that's where we need to have food safety nets just like financial safety nets. But it's very difficult to massage the food price network in, in that sense. I suppose what I'm really saying is gerrymander the market. Well, I, don't, I think actually you need to go the other way. Uh, number one, we need better information on the stocks that are available, which we don't have from some countries because that creates uncertainty in markets. Uh, Long-range weather forecasting for Africa would make a huge difference. Uh, safety nets on the most vulnerable, sort of lactating, pregnant mothers, children under age three, a lot of the safety net types of programs. Uh, in areas like the Horn of Africa, where you may want to actually have some small stocks perhaps developed with the World Food Program. So I think you need a combination of policies because the diversity of the world suggests you're going to need different types of responses to these dangers. The multi-speed economic world that we have at the moment, you've been talking about mm -hmm. it for some time, uh, now it's a reality. Uh, we, we, th there's no doubt about it. Um, but managing it uh, with all these other complex issues is going to be nigh on impossible. Well, it's going to be difficult. I hope it won't be impossible. But let, let's take the picture. Uh, with a lot of the emerging markets, they're actually had very strong comebacks. For the issue now for them is inflation, uh, asset bubbles, avoiding a potential boom and bust. In the case of the United States, you've got, I think, some slightly improving growth, but you're still going to have a lot of people out of work. That's going to put pressure. And then you're going to have the longer-term issue of getting ahead of the wave of large-scale spending. In Europe, it's navigating around the, the iceberg of the sovereign debt. But in all of them, and this is an important point, you have to keep the focus on long-term growth. And your point is we need, it's going to be difficult as countries design policies for each of those problems not to be interfering with one another. And my point on that is the failure of the G20 and the failure of a coordinated response to deal with that. Well, I think that's a little premature. Um, I think the... They've the, been at it now for 18 months, the G20, trying to coordinate a response. Well, but you've seen uh, uh, an economic recovery. Uh, we, frankly, were staring into the abyss of a very bad disaster about two years ago. You've started to have some growth, but now the challenge will be, particularly as you get different stages of recovery, how to be able to do the right policies. For example, in the developing world, they're going to have to start to raise interest rates in some countries, have appreciation of the currency, look at its effect on financial market. That's a different posture than what you're going to need to do in Europe or the United States. I think that's doable. You're being far more optimistic about the uh, challenges ahead. Well, I have nature of my business is to try to solve problems jobs. It's going to be very difficult to... My, one of my guests, the Canadian finance minister, says the biggest issue is jobs mm -hmm. at the moment, creating jobs. It's not... The, the, the what developed economies are going to have to accept a higher level of unemployment. True or false? False. And here's why. They're going to need to be able to uh, actually deal with the types of things that have a change in economy. They're going to, at the same time they're dealing with the short-term sort of demand issues, they're going to need to take on some of the structural issues to create additional jobs and competition in different areas, innovation, uh, in some cases a deregulation of some areas where you've had oligopolistic practices. So I don't think that either the politics or the economics mean you have to accept high joblessness. Why are you so optimistic about a G20 process that is now too big and too cumbersome, some would say, to actually get consensus or agreement? I wouldn't say I'm too optimistic. I believe that we can use this form 
to try to address some of the problems we talked about, enhancing food security, dealing with food price volatility, uh, trying to manage some of this multi-speed recovery, focus on financial inclusion. Now, look, you know, sometimes people want home runs all the time. In my business, over 30 years of public policy, you get a lot of singles, you know, you get some walks, you avoid the strikeouts, you can move the process forward. And that's the nature of a complex international economy.